And welcome back to Meeting of the Minds. Today I'm here with the great Timothy Flanders, man who I really respect, and I'm really happy to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us, Tim. <laughs> thanks, thanks for having me, brother. I, I'm I'm not great, but <laughs> uh, never been called great before. So, but thank you for having me. I, I, I always great to talk with Eugene. You you uh, joined us on our show uh, maybe a month ago, so it was a great time talking to you. So thanks for having me on. Absolutely. You're a modest man. You inspired me to start uh, my spiritual strength blog page. When I saw uh, your page with all your links, I just thought it was great. I love what you do. Right on, man. All right. Yeah, I, I loved love what you do, too, man. So glad we can work together and have a show together. So definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So I wanted to tap you for, for some information because I really respect your scholarship. So I'll take your I'll kick you right into things. So I have the Ludwig Gott book. I had an old copy of the book. Now, I heard that there might be um, modernism that crept into the new book. Is that true or no? Have you heard anything like that? Uh, I'm actually <laughs> I'm actually having the editor on my show in a couple of weeks um, whose name is Festigi. Um, and so let's see. What's his name? So Robert Festigi, Ph.D. This is the he's the guy who did the uh, fully revised and updated by Robert Festigi. And to my knowledge, all I know, all I've ever heard of the actual changes of, of them being certain uh, English language changes like Holy Writ to Holy Scripture or different citations being Roman numerals to the more modern usage. And he also has citations to the modern Code of Canon Law as opposed to the other one, which is not in force anymore. And he also has references to the Vatican II documents added in to the existing references. But I have, I am not aware of any actual changes of Good. substance in Good. terms of the actual. So I, I yeah, I, I actually contacted uh, Baronius Press and I asked them because I was trying to put a link on my own website for the apostolate because um, there are some free versions out there online. And I I did I did find out from Baronius that all the free versions are illegal. Like this is this is the only version that you can get because that's the copyright according to the the diocese of Freiburg, Germany. Uh, Baronius owns the copyright in English, so this is the only legal version you can get. Obviously, you can buy a a deused version of the older version, but anyway, I I don't I'm not aware of anything that's actually modernist out in that volume. So okay. Okay, great. No, I, I, I don't know where I even heard that from, but I figured I'd run that by you, and I always like to um, debunk anything that's not true, right? So that's good. Yeah, man. All right. So the next thing I was really thinking a lot about, which really struck me when going through this book, and I'm still going through it, but the theological notes. And I think there's a lot of misunderstandings for people, the difference between infallibility versus we are certain, right? The, uh, infallibility versus certainty versus binding, and how all three of those, I know those aren't the theological notes, but can you speak to how those notes play into those? Yeah, absolutely. That That's, you're hitting on in what my opinion, in my opinion, this is one of the most important issues in dogma today, because you, you'll you have very, very prominent intellectuals. I, I've, fortunately, I, I've heard this from one of them personally, where they, they break everything down into well, is that infallible or is it not infallible? That's that's the only dichotomy that matters. But that that's really not a uh, that's not the way our fathers understood the faith and how they passed it down. What they did was everything ha comes under the virtue of piety, and the virtue of piety is we us giving to our parents, in particular, the reverence which is due to them, and being reverent to our our fathers and our parents and our fatherland as well, our country, it's part of patriotism. Um, not the, not sort of the modern notion of that. It's very different, but there is uh, so there, so there is a, a very strong sense of virtue being reverent to our parents and what they pass down to us. So that includes everything he, they pass down to us. And that, so that's really everything. So that's from the scriptures and tradition on the one hand, but you also have customs, that are completely oral, like dating, you know, courtship is a totally a custom. They, you know, they passed it down orally. It's not something the, the church ever dogmatized because it wasn't necessary to dogmatize. It was fully cut in the custom. Uh, it also has to do with the architecture, the music, 
uh, all sorts of other things, everything that you can think of that the fathers passed down to us. But if you lose the virtue of piety, it's going to affect all things at once because it's all hinges on passing down the tra- everything. The word tradition simply means what's passed down. So the word tradition can be applied to just everything that's passed down. And it can be also applied, on the other hand, to the specific deposit of faith, which I'll, I'll mention in just a moment. But that's why, um, that's why at the same time as you had all of this revolution in uh, orthodoxy, you had just all these heresies going around in the 1960s, you also had destruction of architecture and music because it's the same virtue of piety. You don't have piety for the father's orthodoxy, you're not going to have piety for their architecture and music either. You're just going to st- destroy everything, but it all hinges on this virtue of piety. So once we have piety established, then we can, then we're going to distinguish between the deposit of faith on the one hand and then all these other things which are Some of them are called the monuments of the fathers, which are the things our fathers created to perfect the tradition or to guard the tradition. So that would include architecture. It also include the writings of the church fathers, the writing of the scholastics, like St. Thomas Aquinas' Summa is maybe the most, uh, the greatest monument of all the monuments, maybe. Um, So that's, so like the Summa is not a part of the deposit of faith per se, but it is a great monument to the deposit of faith, which guards the deposit of faith. So um, what we, we get into the theological notes when we start to make distinctions in our certainty and the binding character of each of these different uh, propositions, because this has to do with the development of doctrine. It's just, it's just such a huge topic. I just keep on going and going here. But this is um, so it has to do with the development of doctrine because you have the scripture and the tradition. So um, you have the original deposit of faith, which included an oral tradition, and then it was also written down in the New Testament. So we have, you have oral and written at the very beginning, which is the deposit of faith. So then you have, so in that deposit of faith, you have certain truths which is, so for example, on Trinity Sunday, we just read the gospel, baptizing everything, everyone in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That was the truth and the deposit of faith, but the word Trinity was added later as a development. The word Trinitas does not exist in the deposit of faith, and that's why in the very early days of the, of the church, this, even, the, even the term Trinity was controversial at the time, which is kind of shocking maybe for some viewers, but that's it's actually a development. The word Trinity doesn't exist in the Bible, doesn't exist in the positive, you know, the earliest records, but it is a conclusion from the scripture itself. We had the scripture baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then we have a term which is used to guard that same tradition to make sure that it is safe from corruption into heresy, so that they could, because there was all these heresies of the Trinitarian doctrine in the beginning. So, <clears throat> you have that process going on over 2000 years. And you, when you have that process going on, it typically takes two different uh, modes of development. One, there is simply the, there's the reaction to heresy development, which is where there's a heresy that comes out. Then we have to add something to the monuments to clarify the tradition, to make sure that it's safe. So the Nicene Creed is the, the most, common thing that everybody knows. Everybody recites it. If you're at the Novus Ordo, you hear it at the Latin Mass or whatever. Everybody knows the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed. You read that in, or you say that in the Rosary. That is a uh, part of the the monuments of the faith. But in particular, the Nicene Creed was something that was added as a development in order to guard against a heresy. So that thing was an addition to the deposit of faith, but then it was dogmatized. So that's where it was made binding on all Christians, because it was an an ecumenical council. It was solemnly anathematizing the contrary. It is an infallible pronouncement from an ecumenical council. So here's the... It was already binding, and now it's infallible. (laughs) It was already already binding and certain, but now it was declared infallibly with that word, right? Yeah, and that's, that's, that's a good point. A very important point is, so you have the theological notes on the one hand, which are... These, these are the degrees of certainty and binding, the binding character, the degrees of binding nature, which we ascribe to any particular proposition whatsoever. Everything from the Trinity is one God in three to uh, like the St. Andrew prayer novena at Christmas. 
which is merely a pious belief. No, no Catholic is bound to believe that that novena is efficacious, but it is a pious belief that is handed down for the Father. So we'll, we can get into that a little bit later. But a very important point you just brought up is the, the difference between uh, the source of those certainties, because these different, sor- these different certainties come from different sources on the other hand. So on the other hand, you have an, a magisterial organ is one term for it, where the, the church teaching makes uh, has a means for creating this certainty. So the, the most common one today you hear is merely papal infallibility, but that's merely one and actually also the least common right, right. organ of magisterial authority. Extraordinary, so th- right. Exactly. That's why it's called an extraordinary. Extraordinary means rare, infrequent, only for extreme cases. That's, that's what that actually means. The actual ordinary means of, of, of infallibility is the deposit of faith, is, is what, what we call what some... And the problem is there's, there's many different terms that are used differently in different eras. So if you, you read the same terms or read about this 100 years ago or 200 years ago, you're going to get different terms sometimes used. So that's what's difficult. Here's what extremely... Um, let's see if I have that. Oh, this one. So this book right here is the uh, kind of authoritative text on tradition. This is uh, Cardinal Franzelin. And Franzelin, he, yeah. Father Ripperger recommended yep. that one. Hey, there you go. Yep, yep. Father Ripperger wrote the forward to this. Uh, Ryan Grant translated it. This is the book. It's a little difficult. It's it's if you're not familiar with this type of writing, it's a little difficult to get into. It's it's not only academic. It's it's very Latinate if you will. Um, so it's kind of difficult to read, but he does go in through all this stuff. And this is, this is pretty much the authority on divine tradition. This is the greatest work probably ever read, written on it. Oh, you've got it right here. <laughs> Look at all that. Hold on a second. Now I'm going through everything. Standing up, seeing my shorts. I have, so I have that one. I have the Franz Lynn. My cover's a little different. Oh, nice. Sweet. Okay. Yeah. I didn't read that. I've only, I've read Dimite. Oh, okay, I have not read that one, but I know that's came Excellent. out recently. And then I got these: can magisterial documents contain error? Topics on tradition, Father Ripperger, and tradition in the church by who's this? Aegeus. Oh, oh yeah, I've heard, I've heard of that guy. But I've I've not read uh, any of those except for Franzelin and Ripperger. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 awesome. So I mean, um, so the important, and this is where. And this is Ripperger does this really well, I think, in his his works on the subject. He's also got Binding Force of Tradition, which is a really good sum, summation. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's nice to get those summation. But yeah, that's definitely for the viewers. Uh, I think Binding Force of Tradition by Ripperger is probably the best work to introduce anybody to this topic because it's very short. I think it's like 50 pages and it's just really very clear, lays it out. So basically, when we go back to the virtue of piety, we understand that the normal and ordinary so this is sometimes called the universal and ordinary magisterium this is what most things in the catholic faith are dogmatized or infallible based on this this organ ordinary organ this is the ordinary means of 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 uh the magisterium it, it's simply the bishop it's basically the bishop giving you the faith or his representative the priest it's giving you the faith and then your parents give you the faith and that's that and that, that's how the vast majority of all Catholics receive the faith through 2,000 years. That, that's it. The ordinary and universal magisterium. This is, this is the basis upon which St. John Paul II condemned female ordination. He explicitly states in Ordinatio Sacra Dotales, I think, I think it's 1994, he says, based on the universal constant teaching of the Church, he says the Church has no authority to ordain women. So he's saying this is already infallible based on the ordinary universal jurisdiction. We've always taught this. There's no the church has no authority to to change it. So that's a reference to. So so I, this that document is infallible, but not by virtue of papal infallibility, but by virtue of the ordinary tradition of infallibility. So so you basically have that's the ordinary means of something being binding. It's binding on your conscience. You have to believe it under pain of mortal sin. Um, the, so then the, there's the extraordinary magisterium, which is only in those extreme cases, which is basically the, uh, the 
Ecumenical Council or the Papal, the Papal Infallibility, of which the Ecumenical Council is by far the most common by a ratio of 28 to, I mean, <laughs> well, that's another, that's another debate altogether, but there is, because uh, cause the Pope, some, some people, I don't know where this comes from, but some people say that the, the Papal Infallibility has only been uh, actually exercised twice in history. I don't believe that. I think that's ridiculous. Um, but there, there is, there are many dozens of exercises of papal authority, but often like John Paul II, he is, they're kind of making reference to an infallible tradition and saying that's the final say. Um, so it's kind of debatable as to this instance or that instance, was that a, was an infallible by virtue of papal infallibility or was what infallible by virtue of the ordinary infallibility that's kind of the debate so you could you could count we could debate on you know how many papal infallibilities or but in any case the the pope does make that final say in any case whether he does it by virtue of his own authority or by virtue of sort of the traditional authority but to to get at to the main question all these different distinctions we're trying to get into is to basically say that there because of there's these different organs of magisterial authority it creates these different degrees of certainty because there's also not only these ordinary means of infallibility and extraordinary means of infallibility there's also just simply ordinary uh, when there's no heresy and people are the saints are simply just writing about the faith and they're explaining and expounding the faith to their current time they are making developments by drawing the conclusion from a given truth so they're they're saying uh god uh god became man and jesus christ is god and man so therefore this follows so then they make a conclusion from that truth it's a it's a truth that logically follows from the original truth uh so what i can think of right now this is this was actually happened because of a heresy but even if it didn't, it could have still developed. So, I mean, they said that God was, or Jesus Christ is God and man. He has two natures, God and man. And then, therefore, he has two wills. He has a human will and divine will. So there was a heresy with that, but even if that didn't happen, they would have concluded that that was the case as a part of just concluding the truth of what that is. So that is that is what development is. It's just simply um, Christians applying the truths to their necessary conclusion. Now, um, there's also evolution of doctrine, which is the heretical modernist idea of doc, uh, development of doctrine, which is false, but that's another issue. But the point that I'm saying is that we have that what we have is we have this body of writings called the Church Fathers, which are Gre Greek and Latin mostly, but also includes Syriac and Coptic and other fathers as well, which are lesser known. And the Church says that the the, another organ in, of infallibility is if all the fathers agree on a given proposition, that is also infallible. However, they may also agree that a given proposition is of a lesser note. Like there could be a, a majority view that views X, Y, Z to be the case. And then there could be a minority view that also has a strong position on something else, which is slightly different. So then the church can look at those two views and they can make a judgment and say, well, this one is more probable because it has more fathers or it has more authority or various reasons. So that's what the lesser notes are also a part of the, the, the virtue of piety. So we need to all, we need to still allow those things to teach us. Like Ripperger puts it really well, I think in, uh, I don't know if it's binding force or magisterial authority, one of the two, where he says that we're not permitted to pick and choose what we believe. If we are wondering about X, Y, Z, we're supposed to look into the tradition and see what the church has said on it. What I mean, 95 to 99 percent of everything that you may encounter in the, your life today has already been figured out by the church or at least pronounced by the saints. So even if this really even aren't, if, we more enlight, aren't we more enlightened? <laughs> Go right. ahead, keep going. Keep yeah, going. yeah. So I mean, Go ahead. it's no, no. That, that's exactly right. Um, the the so-called enlightenment, or more accurately, or more accurately, the darkening 
of it, the intellect, the irrational, the age of irrationality is what the enlightenment really is. Um, yeah. So the, there's, there's different, we, we are not permitted to make our own opinion unless literally every other saint and no one has ever made up judgment about certain things. Like, like for an example would be like, uh, you know, cloning or some, some kind of new brand new technology that's creating some gr just great new culture of death thing that they figured out that they've, nobody's ever heard of before. Then the church needs to make a pronouncement at that time. Uh, you know, if there hasn't been a pronouncement about, so like I, for example, I think that I, I have not read on this, so I could be wrong about this, but last I checked, the church had not made a moral pronouncement on what's called intersexuality, which is where some called sometimes called hermaphrodism, where a, ma a man or, or a woman is born with sexual organs of the other gender as just a basically a sort of an anomaly or disorder. So there hasn't been a, as last I heard, I could be wrong, somebody can correct me, but that's an example of something that the church has not quite figured out on the moral level, and they haven't pronounced a judgment on that. So in that case, if that's the case, if that's true, one could possibly have somewhat of a more free opinion on that particular issue because it's a new, a brand new moral question, you know. Um, so, but as you said, it w whatever the opinion would not be something willy nilly that, oh, now you get to pick up anything you want. It would still be based on the church tradition. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You're, so you're still not really free to just make up your own whatever opinion you want. I mean, everything is still, it has to be completely in line with whatever other principles there are. There are certain, I, I think of another example, there are certain uh, moral questions regarding the conjugal act, which were disputed before the council and have since been sort of thrown open, whatever, because of our sexualized age. But there are certain moral questions in that area, too, that were not totally figured out as well. So there's there's just certain things in the moral tradition, the moral theology, um, were not wor worked out. So if you read a moral theology manual, many many of the, the one I read is Prumer. I'm not familiar with a lot of other manuals, but in his manual, he'll make a distinction. He'll say, well, the authors say that this this is the more probable opinion that this is the case, but there's also a minority view that says this is the case. So this is an example of these different certainties and saying, well, these things have been defined. These things are less certain because we haven't, they haven't judged on them, but there is a more probable opinion. But a very a, a crucial point that Ripperger makes is there is such a thing as a common teaching, which is what's known as a sententia communis, which is basically what the scholastics, so this is another body of fathers who are not the church fathers, but this is basically kind of St. Thomas Aquinas until St. Saint, Alphonsus Saint Liguri. So basically around 1200 to around 1800. So that period, there was a great deal of um, academics who were holy men who were working with the bishops as sort of a, a secretaries of the magisterium, if you will. They were kind of a... a, a you know, the backup team of the magisterium. They weren't the magisterium per se, but they were kind of uh, parity like that, like at Vatican II, but in a, in a good way. Um, so they, so Pius XI, uh, sorry, Pius IX says that if all those scholastics agree that a particular thing is de fide, is binding, then all, if they, if they all agree on something, that's also infallible too. That's also an organ of infallibility. So there's so many different ways, and it all comes back to basically just the church and the church itself being infallible. Um, but then if they all agree that something is sort of a common teaching, but it's not binding, a common teaching is uh, the level of authority where we, we must accept this, this common teaching as a matter of piety because we still have to have piety unless we have a grave cause otherwise. So there are cases where the church has reversed certain common or so-called common teachings or something that was at least at least probable, at least you know, common in the sense that it was popular. There could be popular ideas out there that are, you know, that are sort of reversed or changed a little bit by the church because they're still kind of on the level of free opinion, but we're still not we are still not allowed to just make our own decision about that. We still have to be bound to our fathers and what they, they handed down to us. And so we, we, 
you have to have this grave cause. And that, that's, that's, that's a similar level that we have to pay to basically every bishop in whatever they say. Um, and especially the congregations of Rome, when the congregations of Rome make pronouncements. And this is something that I think traditional Catholics often miss, too, is that they, they basically just want to say Vatican II just stopped the magisterium. Like magisterium was kind of <laughs> like a, had a hiccup. So then we're just going to not listen to anything since 1962. But that's also not that is not the Catholic position, because you basically are a de facto set of a contest. You're saying, well, I believe the pope is still the pope, but then I'm just going to I'm just going to completely reject everything, you know, whatsoever. And that's that's not the case. You have to have a grave cause, which means that it is a serious it's something based on the principles. It's not your it's not your own opinion. It's not just my well, I disagree. Well, on what grounds? You have to say, well, well, St. Thomas Aquinas says this and all these principles say this and all these fathers say this and there's all these issues with that. So the traditional Catholic movement at best is asserting that there is a grave cause. That's basically the whole trad movement is asserting that there's a grave cause to dissent from the what is popular today, basically, what is popular among many bishops, including the Bishop of Rome, to assert. Um, and so they're saying, well, we th there's a grave cause here. Um, and this, this goes right into Vatican II, because Vatican II explicitly says that nothing in Vatican II is binding at the end of Lumen Gentium in the appendix. It says nothing is binding unless we say so. But they never said anything was binding in the entire Vatican II. So nothing is actually binding. However, it's still an ecumenical council. We still need to receive it with humility and piety. There's still bishops. And there's, I mean, frankly, I mean, there's basically 70, 80 percent. I mean, I don't know what percentage. It's hard, hard to say that. But there's a great deal of Vatican II that's absolutely fine, absolutely orthodox. I mean, like, most of it is fine, really. I mean, the great majority, I would say, probably 95 percent if I were to bet on anything. But there's these little passages that the liberals at the council were able to make ambiguous. So there's these little parts that are seriously ambiguous. And then the heretics after the council were able to push all their heresies based on these passages. So then the trads are saying, well, Hey, we have grave cause that you need to clarify this thing. Please clarify it. Please clarify it. And they continue to say, please clarify it. But the vegetarian has not for the most part clarified. And that's the situation we're in. Yeah. And the way I've been looking at those the, these um, theological notes, I don't know if this is a healthy way to look at it, but almost as like level one, level two, level three. So kind of like I view it in my head as, OK, day fee day, which which is dogma. Right. Then it's church doctrine right underneath. Then what do we have here? Proximate to the faith, pertaining to the faith. Level five is common teaching. And then level six would be theological opinions of lesser grades of certainty. So I guess. And then how the, the theological censures relate to them, where it's like heresy, proximate to heresy. Am I thinking about that correctly or maybe ineffectively, like comparing the censures to the, um, the notes? Oh, yeah, that's that's kind of they, they correlate to my knowledge. Um, there's also the John Paul II. He did kind of simplify it even further. And he made he made a three tiered system where he's okay. got one, two, three only. So it's kind of like. The number three, like one, two, one and two is binding, and the number three encompasses all the free opinions, basically. Okay. Um, but the difficulty there is that it's it's too number three is too is would would clump in uh, sententia communis, which you you are bound to accept uh, on the virtue of piety, but not on the virtue of faith, uh, unless you have grave cause. So it's technically a free opinion, technically, yeah. but you can't just whatever you know whereas lower than that is those those pious beliefs so like believing in certain apparitions or whatever or the saint andrew Novena or things like that those are more those are more where you do actually have a free opinion you're still going to reverence these pious beliefs and you shouldn't you should never certainly never shun them at all that's that would be against piety you know if you were to do it on the very basis that they were hand down to us, but there you're far more free to believe in those things than you are like a sententia community. So the, that's the only downside of kind of simplifying it. But I think it, it also is a lot easier for a lot of people to, to grasp, but that there is just a basically one, two, three. 
Um, cause Ott basically takes one and two. That's like one and two are both day fide and then three and four, like the proximate of the faith and the sentencia certa. Those are both still binding, but you don't commit heresy. You commit error when you, when you go against these. So this, so the, the one, two, that's when, and this, this is another example of people talking about heresy when you cannot have a heresy unless you're, you are obstinately, you are obstinately denying a de fide truth of the faith. So you could be denying a certain teaching of the faith, but you're, you wouldn't even be a, you wouldn't be a heretic at that point. You'd just be an erroneous theologian. So you would have a lesser censure to you. Um, but so there could be a lesser penalty. It's basically just it's, it's all about the level of piety that you kind of you need basically for what is what is absolutely the case uh, that everyone should be clear about the dogmas of the faith, denying the Nicene Creed. So basically denying the Nicene Creed is worse than denying oh, um, some lesser truth um, that's also a truth. Like the, the two ends of marriage, for example, um, procreative and remedy for lust or mutual aid. That, the two ends of marriage has been defined by the Holy Office, but it's on a, a lower level. So you know, if you deny that, you're not a heretic. But if you deny the Nicene Creed and you do so obstinately, that would be a heretic, you know, be a heresy. And so the other issue is that there is an obstinacy because the a censure is the church in her mercy attempting to reform this criminal, basically this sort of spiritual criminal who is leading souls to hell. And he she is seeking to help him reform his own soul first. So she censors him. So, so the common example, obviously, is Exurge Domine from Leo X against Martin Luther. And the, tr- the difficulty is that, like, if you read that in Denziger, they basically just list two dozen propositions from Luther, but they don't actually make a distinction as to how bad they really are. They basically just say, these are all bad, retract them or else. So that's the difficulty because it's not, but that at that time there was wasn't as much of a system as we have now in terms of the theological notes. But the I, Rome was not asserting that all of those were formally heretical, but he they were at least saying that they were harmful beliefs or erroneous. Now the lowest, <clears throat> I, actually I, I think I think the lowest theological censure is called offensive to pious ears. I don't know if that's, I mean, I have it in front of me. Is that the lowest one? I'm not that sure sounds, if it is. That's, that, but, sounds, oh, that sounds right. But I mean, then there's the other ones that say a captious, ambiguous, and a scandalous proposition. Oh, that's kind right, of a different right, thing. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, those are also, I mean, yeah, there's all these lesser censures, which are not, it's saying that it's not formally heretical. And th- what's really interesting is if, if, if you go back, if you have a copy of Denziger, or you can look it up online, I think, yeah, I think the source actually is said a contest, but they have the encyclical Actorum Fidei from Pius the Six. That is an encyclical, and it's very interesting to read this on this on this very subject, because the encyclical of Pius the Sixth was one of the first universal encyclicals. So it's addressed to all Christians. And it was condemning a synod, a local synod in in Tuscany, Italy, called the Synod of Pistoia, which in many ways was a prefigurement of Vatican II. They were advocating vernacular liturgy. They were denigrating the liturgy as it was. They said it was not like participatory and that type of thing. They didn't use those words. But you read through what he starts condemning, and you're you're really shocked. Wow, you know, these are— a lot of these things were advocated at Vatican II. And so when you actually read this Octorum Fidei, you find him condemning, and many, many of these things are actually just condemned on the basis that they're offensive to pious ears. So, for example, one of the things they condemn is that limbo is a, limbo is a, what are they, I don't remember what they say, but they say something about limbo and they denigrate it as just a ridiculous, rash, crazy belief which that's offensive to pious ears. And the reason is because limbo is not a de fide proposition, but it is a, you, I mean, think, I think we could debate on certain things. I, I, I would 
assert that it was about it's about sentencia communis potentially sentencia certa potentially depends there's a great book recently uh by my friend michael lofton on this very issue um but he makes the case that um it's essentially still on the level of not dogmatized so but nevertheless you don't just you don't just even if somebody's not dogmatized and we're not technically bound to it, we are still bound by piety. And you never ridicule any of any of the beliefs of the fathers in this sense, especially a common, I mean, limbo is very common. It's not something that's just like the St. Andrew prayer or something. There's something much lower than that. That's just merely a pious belief. So, um, so he condemns them on the basis of these various things. I'm not remember correctly if, if he condemns it based on offensive to bias ears, but he, he condemns various propositions based on offensive to bias ears. And so what that means, what does that mean, offensive to bias ears? It, it means that it is a scandal for the faithful to hear such a thing, which could lead to a heresy. Yeah. It could lead to them thinking that you're teaching a heresy. So it doesn't technically only mean heresy. It doesn't technically. So this is an example of many things Pope Francis says or other prelates have said, which are offensive to pious ears. You can't just go around saying things without pr a precise distinction. That's the problem with our social media age is that you are we are able to hear what Pope Francis says in his sermon this morning, which is remarkable. And there's a great, a great deal of benefit that can come from that with communication, but it's also has the potential to be misconstrued and misunderstood on the one hand it's just people not translating properly or whatever and also you know if somebody's talking in a pri sort of a, a small mass or if somebody's talking uh that's kind of me more meant for this individual person and there's more context to it and there's all this other stuff you need to understand uh it's difficult to say that and make that repeatable to everyone in the whole world immediately and make that understood properly. And, and so there's things that are said, which are offensive to bias ears in that they can lead to heresy. They can lead to be understood as a heretical way of, you know, Pachamama is a perfect example. Um, it, it was done and it was a scandal to everyone, many. And then when they were asked to clarify, what is this? The actual news official Vatican news press office said, I don't know what it is. They said, well, it could be the Virgin Mary. It could be Mother Earth. You kind of make what you like of it. And that's exactly an example of offensive to bias years. You can't just do something which is so offensive if it's if it is heretical and idolatrous. It's completely offensive and offense to God, most of all. And then just sort of say, well, you make what you want out of it. That's that is absolutely unacceptable and it causes people to lose faith. It damages their faith. And that's why these things are censured. You know, even if we assume that Pachamama, if she, let's say, let's say she was fully clothed, first of all, and it was actually the Virgin Mary. And then they said, then they said, Oh, well, we don't know what it is. Well, they should clarify that this is, this is the Virgin Mary. This is exactly what it is. Uh, all these clarifications, the magisterium has a duty to clarify because of this offense to pious ears. It, it hurts people's faith. It hurts people's, uh, their spiritual lives. It's very damaging to people's souls. So that's why that is still a censure, even though if, if, that were the, if it was the Virgin Mary and she was fully clothed and there was really actually nothing technically wrong with it, but it just seemed like it was wrong, uh, it should still be condemned unless they clarified it. It seems like it seems like it's one of those two low ones, either offensive to pious ears or malasonos or whatever. Like it sounds bad, right? Though I think those are two separate ones, but they're they're kind of very close. It's um, yeah. It, that's why th those, like you said, those things they can't. You got to they got to be careful, and it's and like you said, it's about piety and sticking with the tradition, and even if it's and if it's ambiguous. That's not sticking with the trans with the tradition. So that's that's important. That's so important, Tim. So if my understanding is correct, those theological censures, I would kind of group one and two as okay, this is infallible. Then I would take three and four and I would say this is certain. And of course, the infallible is certain. And then I would look at five 
as now that's that's still binding on the faithful. Like you have to believe that. And even six has like there's like a six A, six B, six C, right? <laughs> if you wanted to group it like that with the numbers, it's like even six B and six A as you work up, that's still binding. Even if there's an ap- a pious opinion, you still can't just say, well, you know, oh, like even um whatever it might be, even the, like the Leonine prayers. You can't say, well, I don't care about the Leonine prayers. That would be temerious, right? That's a rash statement. It sounds bad. Uh, you're 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 cutting out. Oh, am I still cutting out? Oh no, you're good now. You were, you were saying that one two three four is oh. heresy, what? but one two is binding. Go ahead. One and two infallible, three and four and up is certain, right? You're certain when yeah. when it's level four, it's you're still certain. Five and up would be binding, and even possibly six a and six b pious opinion still is binding on the faithful without grave reason right right that- I, I i mean i i i understand it i mean i'm not a scholar here but the, <laughs> the way i understand way i understand ought here and understanding yeah. it and reading it um the and what ripperger says the com it's the common teaching is number five which is is technically a free opinion but you cannot you cannot go against it without a grave okay. cause. Whereas okay. six, six is, um, there are levels of six. So there's the probable right. level, which is this, this is a, this is, there is not a common teaching. There's not sort of a, a somewhat of a consensus. So there's not a common teaching. There is disagreement between the theologians or between the fathers on a probable position, but then different authors will then make a judgment call and say, well, this is the more probable one. So this is something what that Billerman does in his famous five five ways to deal with a heretical pope, and he he discusses five different ways, and he says, uh, I think it's the very first one where he says that a pope can never be heretical ever, and he says this is a probable opinion, which means it's on the level of free opinion, but he thinks it's a probable, so it, it could be okay, you know, it's 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 not so then on the lowest level. Of a of a number six, like theological opinion, is a tolerated opinion. So it's tolerated. It's it's merely tolerated. It is not. It does not have a great authority. It does not have a great deal of weight among the fathers or the uh, scholastics. It's merely tolerated. So that's the lowest opinion, and that would be kind of the pious beliefs and that type of thing. Uh, but the pious beliefs do have a greater weight than I think that a than a uh, tolerated opinion because they are piously held. They're passed down. Uh, they have a great deal more. Now you just froze. How about Did we now? lose our connection? Uh, I hear you. I see you. No, you know, here, like I well, I can hear you. But here, let me plug in. I can actually plug in my uh, <clears throat> switch over to the plug. I should have started this when we started this, but I didn't. <laughs> that's all right. Let's see if this works. I don't know if that's you or me, but I've, I've been seeing you fine. Oh, you about... seeing me fine? Okay. Yeah. I don't know how this if it's go for Am forward or back. Okay. Yeah, you you look good now. That's good. Cool. Anyway, so yeah, pious beliefs. Um, I it, that's that's how I understand it based on Ripperger and Ott. Um, oh. that the the six are. They they have some biting force based on piety, so we should we should err on the side of the more probable opinion as opposed to the less probable opinion, unless you have a very grave cause otherwise. But you're much more free in that whole area in terms of pipes belief. You're much more free to sort of pick and choose some things, uh, but you have to just do so on right principles and piety and still involved with that. Makes sense. Right. That, that's a tremendous, a lot, a lot of really good, great stuff there. So now I'll change gears on you a little bit. Communicatio and Socrates. What's your understanding of that? What is, what, what is allowed? What, we're not allowed to pray with people who are not Catholic, right? That's was always the church's teaching. So I think now, I don't, first of all, I don't know where I would find that in any of my books. And then I think about how does that apply to common, more common situations in terms of attending weddings of non-Catholics or Catholics that are married outside of the church, um, attending a Passover Seder, 
you, your friends, you, your friends, the kids are your your kids are friends, eight years old with the Jewish family. They want to do a Hanukkah night, and then sometimes they do that, and then maybe they do the candle prayers. Are you allowed to attend that? Are they allowed to come to your wedding? Are you allowed to go to a Jewish bar mitzvah? Thinking about things like that, what are the limits of that um, communicatio in Socrates? That's an excellent question, and I, I want to give you a really good answer. So I'm trying to find where it talks about this in Prumer. Maybe I'll find it after the show comes down. But first yeah. of all, we're going to make a very strong distinction between other Christians and right. non-Christians. Because Jews, Jews are kind of our friends right now, but Jews and Mohammedans are both religions of the spirit of the Antichrist, which means that they explicitly deny Jesus Christ in their religion. So in, I would hold that their religions to be much worse than Hinduism, for example. Hinduism worships demons, but that's, it's a lot worse to explicitly deny Jesus Christ, in my opinion. I think that's exactly. a, far, a far worse thing. Um, and so people are mixing with Jews and just sort of, you know, doing their bar mitzvahs or anything like that. So I, I, that would be an absolutely serious, a very serious thing to consider whatsoever. Whereas with the Protestants, they do confess Jesus Christ. They have a valid baptism. It's a much different ball game with an, another Christian um, so you're talking, it's like the difference between heretics and apostates, if you will. I mean, it's a, a, a lot different with Jews and Mohammedans. So the the part in Primer, which I'll find after, and you, maybe you can put it on the show notes or something yeah. when I find this reference. But he basically says that formal cooperation with heretics is never allowed. And what he means by that is praying with a heretic for the purpose of worshiping God. So you are praying with a heretic so that you can, and, and, you, and you're praying with his service, by the way, too. I mean, you can invite a heretic to the Catholic Mass, and you can always pray, you can invite him to the Rosary and all this great stuff. I certainly, so you can certainly pray with a heretic in that sense. But what he's talking about is if you were ever at a, her, a heretic's uh service of any kind. So you go to a, a Protestant wedding is a is a heretical service, technically. Now, we can also make the distinction between a formal heretic and a material heretic, because right. the vast majority of Protestants are obviously completely ignorant, and they're, you know, they're basically absolved from their heresy because they don't know any better. So we're not saying her heretics in terms of like Martin Luther's a heretic, because he was a pernicious heretic, whereas all of his followers, or many of them at least, you know, have no idea what they're doing. So, you know, we're not we're not going to fault them for that. But it is still heretical because it is a, 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 a Protestant wedding is asserting that a Protestant has the right to celebrate a sacrament outside the jurisdiction of the church, which is heretical. It's it's wrong. All sorts of different problems with that. And besides that, they they hold to heretical beliefs personally. They're you know, they're a they are a heretical body, which denies heresies, which are defined by the Council of Trent. So we talked about you know, they have actual, these are not just these lower beliefs. They deny things like they believe in sola fide, which is a heresy. They believe in only two sacraments, which is a heresy. These are all things that are defined and anathematized by the Council of Trent. And so these are very serious things. This is not just, uh, they just have a different way of doing things or they have a different tradition. That's one of my worst, <laughs> that's one of my least favorite ways to say it. Like, oh, they come from the Protestant tradition. Well, um, it is a tradition. I mean, they do pass it down, so it is a tradition per se. But um, so, uh, what we need this is a perfect example of balancing truth and charity, um, because so so formal cooperation, Primer says, that is defined as going to a Protestant service in order to worship God. So you are tr you are trying to use the Protestant service itself, in so much as it is a Protestant service. To worship God. Now, another distinction that's so many different distinctions here because it's such a mess. It's a big mess. And so there's only, there's like, you know, because Protestants call upon the holy name of Jesus. And so if you're calling upon the holy name of Jesus, St. Paul says that's an act of the Holy Spirit. And so if, if a Protestant is calling upon the name of the holy, of, of the holy name of Jesus, he is acting by the Holy Spirit. He cannot, it's impossible for him to actually do that 
really truly unless the Holy Spirit allows him to do that and gives him the power to do that. So, so when you if you were to go to a Protestant service, there's going to be a mixture of uh, Catholic things and heretical things because there's no such thing really as a Protestant baptism, for example. There's only one baptism. It's the Catholic baptism. That's the only one that exists. So you're going to get it's basically just Protestants or heretics doing Catholic things without authorization. And so there's a certain amount of Catholic things that go on at a Protestant service of any kind. So Prumer says, he makes this distinction. He says, if you go to a Protestant service to worship in a Protestant manner to worship God, that is a, that is a sin of sacrilege, or I'm not sure if it's sacrilege, but which I had the reference here, but it is a series of sin that you cannot do that. It's, it's not allowed. It's seriously, it's a serious problem. You can't just do that. Now, he, however, he does make the distinction that you can sometimes have material cooperation. Material cooperation would be, and he gives an example of going to a funeral out of courtesy. Or and is a wedding? He, his example is a funeral, going to a funeral out of courtesy. So, but I would apply that to a wedding as well. Um, I mean, you're... It's not, t- I mean, funeral is not a sacrament. I guess it's sort of an imitation sometimes of, of the funeral mass, I guess. So it's an imitation of the sacrament. But um, Prumer says you can go out of courtesy. So I would interpret him to understand this to be in terms of charity for that individual soul. So you were making a judgment on, well, should I not go because this person is obviously a heretic and, but I, you know, this is my coworker or somebody like that. And if I were to not go, he would simply be pushed further away from the Catholic faith because, you know, I know him, he's, you know, just, and he's also, you know, he lost his father or whatever. And I know him really well. He's pretty anti-Catholic already. And if I were to just do this, it would just kind of push him away further from the faith. So out of courtesy and charity for him, I'm just going to go and be a material cooperator, which means by that, what I, that is simply that you're there. You're not actually formally cooperating. You're not saying amen to the prayers. You're not praying with them to pray to God in a heretical way. You're simply there to love that individual and try to show them charity and convert them, obviously, and just love them And so, because it's for their sake that you're there. It's not for your sake. You're not trying to worship God in their way, you're trying to do that for him. So that is how I understand Primer. So he says there is a certain context for a material cooperation. You're only there. Now, Ripperger takes a harder line on this. He's actually says that you should not go to marriages. I don't, I think he says maybe at all, but he's, because the marriage is a, is an actual sacrament. It can be between, between, between Protestants so he's he takes a harder line than that, and I think he says that you shouldn't go at all to the marriage. Any non-Catholic to any non-Catholic wedding. Have you have you heard him talk about this? Uh, uh, that's uh, from reading his books. I got the sense that you're not supposed to attend bar mitzvahs, go to Passover seder's, do basically any of those things of other religions. Oh yeah, you should never go to any of those. Pa- never, I would yeah, never I, 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 ever this, go to any Passover anything Jewish, whatever. I've never I, attended I, any of those. No, because uh, I remember as a kid, when we were like six, seven years old, um, my neighbors were Jewish. My, my best childhood friend, I would go there and it was like they would have Hanukkah. And like most of it wasn't anything or whatever it was, would spin the dreidel, have chocolates. And then at one point, though, they were lighting the candles and saying the prayer. And that we just sat quietly for. But I'm thinking now, OK, now as a father, if my kid, you know, if the if the tables are turned now with my son, I wouldn't I wouldn't have him go to that if there's going to be a lighting of candles. If you want to hang out, fine, but not the candle thing. I mean, yeah, I would part of this is like I like I like I've observed, I think what I what I noticed from Prumer and Ripperger and I'm not sure if I'm misunderstanding them, I apologize, but it seemed to be that there was a harder line that Ripperger was taking. And so there 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 may be some gray area here where the theologians kind of disagree. This is an example of a a brand new situation because multiculturalism is about, you know, a hundred years old, 200 years old, maybe, which is a very new situation. Before this, there was a lot more homogeneity, homogeneity. If you, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but in, in different locales. So everybody in this locale was Protestant or everybody was Catholic and the Jews had their space or whatever. So there wasn't as much mixing as there is today. So it is a little bit more of a newer moral problem. Um, so there may be some disagreement on that. Um, 
so from what I can tell, there is a certain material cooperation that can be allowed, sort of permitted um, for the sake of that soul. Um, and so that only, that's how I understand it. I think, uh, go ahead. I was just saying, the only thing that I think about that is then if, if that becomes the principle, then I could apply it to my cousins who are getting married outside of the church. My cousin who's marrying her husband who are getting married outside of the church, both baptized Catholics, and me not going to that, then that maybe looks, then that, then that starts to look like me pushing them further from the church because I'm, I'm judging them. You see what I mean? If that, if the, if the principle becomes how they're going to feel, we're on shaky ground a little bit. I don't know. I don't know. I agree. I agree with you. It, it, I mean, it, it is a difficult, um, <laughs> it is, I think it's a difficult decision because, so for example, I had a friend who divorced his wife and he married again. And I told, because I knew the man, I knew the man as a personal friend. I told him that you should not divorce your wife. I told him, you know, I told him what I thought of what was going on. And that would be a situation where I would not attend that wedding because he understood what was, he understood what I thought about it. And that was, you know, something that I had told him as much as I could out of charity, you know, and, uh, and so that I, you know, I'm, it's, it's certainly not, um, it's not certainly not all about what there's a lot of different factors. It's like, I think of St. Thomas, St. Thomas says you should not rebuke a man if you know that it will make him worse. So you should actually not rebuke him if you know it's just going to, he's an obstinate sinner. It's going to make him worse if you rebuke him. So there is a certain subjective consideration out of charity. You should consider that. But then he also says there's also the common good. So he says if somebody's in a place of authority, you should always rebuke no matter what, even if it's going to make him worse because there's a common good involved so that everyone knows everyone knows uh, that where you stand and you should make that known. And so I think that comes into play too here because if you're sort of maybe in a family situation where everybody knows you're Catholic, nobody else is Catholic, and then you have sort of some egregious, adulterous marriage happening or whatever, and everybody knows it, and you, everybody knows you're Catholic. So if you were to go to that wedding in that sense, it would look like a betrayal of your principles and everybody would know it. And it would just dis, dis, yeah. dis, you know, discredit the whole Catholic faith, basically. And so um, yeah. I think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's somewhat- Unfortunately, we're dealing with, like I think about a lot, a lot of my family, Tim, and, and they are Catholic. Right. And what they would think the Catholic faith is, is you don't judge anyone and you love everyone and you're there for everyone. And look, nothing, nothing would be easier for me to keep nice relations with everyone than to just just go along and keep silent and just disapprove quietly, you know. But and but it actually might push them further away if I don't attend. And that would even that would even hold to like a, a gay marriage. Because they would say, well, Jesus loves everyone and God doesn't judge. And obviously we know that's, and they're like, oh, they're Catholic too. No, 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 you're Catholic. You're actually not Catholic. So it's <laughs> not easy. Yeah I, yeah, I think there, yeah, there, that you bring up another consideration, which is sort of the egregiousness of the, the marriage. Because, you know, it could be just two single Catholics or two single Christians who have never been married before who are man and woman. And they get married on the one hand, so that's basically a natural, valid marriage. Marriage, you know, there's nothing really wrong with that except that they're not Catholic. That's the right. problem. Whereas you could have a, you know, two divorcees who are same sex getting married, who one's Catholic, and then we got a serious problem. And it's like even a, a greater egregious, and and everybody knows it too. So it, it it's a very difficult thing. We we've got a divorce culture, which is, which yeah. has already created this mess that we're in. So, uh, I mean, I don't I don't have a I don't have any kind of authoritative answer on that. I, I can tell you, this is what I do. I try to put all these considerations together as to which wedding I would attend and which I would not attend. But I, I do attend Protestant weddings. Um, I some I some I don't, like I said. Um, but I try my best to do it out of the principles, and I don't formally cooperate with them. So yeah. I, I usually pray the rosary during this <laughs> if I ever have to go. So that's my that's what I do. Uh, and I mean, a lot of a lot of these these things that are a little bit lesser known or lesser understood or even not agreed upon. I mean, all of us laymen 
are kind of doing our best because even our priests are not taught Prumer or the basics anymore. So they don't know the answers either. Some of them, I mean, I think the best thing to do, however, even though I, I, even though I just said that, I usually, if I'm, if I really don't know what to do, I usually find a good priest and then do what he says, because yeah. that's, that's ultimately what you should do in this, in this circumstance. I think, um, you know, when we don't have, we don't have a certainty. We need to go to a priest and get his judgment and do what he says, because that is what is pleasing to the Lord because it's obedience. Yeah. Yeah. This is where it's tough because I know I've asked, cause we, we dealt with the whole spectrum here in my family over the past year. There was a, there was a game between me and my wife's family. There was a gay marriage. There was two cat, two baptized Catholics who chose to be married outside of the church. And then there was, um, um, married, divorced, no annulment and, and a remarriage. So those are three different situations. And now you're dealing with, well, which family you're, you're going to this for one family, but not going to this for the other family. So there's those dynamics that play into the whole thing. And they're all sinful. And it's tough because I asked a lot of priests about this. And my spiritual director said, basically, point blank, I don't want to say anything to you. Like, he didn't want to give an answer, which was kind of a little troubling. Oh, man. Right? What, what did you end up doing in those three situations? Well, so if you uh, if you don't so, mind sharing, no, no, no sure. So, so the, the, the gay marriage, we did not attend because that just seemed like that's just too scandalous. Right. And, and they clearly both know the church's teachings. Then there was was my was my cousin who was, um, again, baptized Catholic, her husband baptized Catholic. But again, Catholic, they're not observing the faith. I I told her about the importance of getting married inside the church. She wanted to she wanted to just get married. A month before the a month before the ceremony, we actually there was a newly ordained priest, and I thought that there was a possibility the newly ordained priest, very zealous, thought he'd be able to shotgun their wedding prep in a month. So I asked my cousin, last ditch effort, you know, it's really important to get married in the church. This priest says he could help you. Will you do this marriage prep in the month? And she said yes. So in my mind, I'm thinking like, okay, there's a real intention to do this. And then that newly ordained priest said, no, he can't do that. He thought that he was uh, able to do it. He wasn't aware. So in my mind, I said, well, the fact that my cousin actually had the intention to do it, even if it was a shotgun, maybe that, you know, they're mo- they could be moved in that direction. So that when we attended and then my aunt, who was who was married, uh, divorced, no annulment, is going to get remarried. I actually responded to her saying that, you know, we can't go because that, again, is. You know, you know, she understands that and everything. Um, but that Corona actually canceled that wedding. So thank God uh, that happened. Well, I, I think that's good because I think most people do understand adultery. Right. I mean, no, nobody wants to get cheated on. They just think the divorce is OK. So um, I think that that's a good I, I, I like what you're saying there, because it kind of that's making divorce. drawing the line of divorce. I think that's right. a good one, whereas the people who are not previously married have a little bit. Yeah. more to more room to uh wiggle in i guess I, I to my knowledge i don't know i just did some annulment work but i don't know i believe i believe that two catholics who get married outside the church is actually an invalid marriage because it's yeah, uh it's invalid and unsacramental. so nevertheless they could since they are still catholic they could become pious at some point right. Right. and then they could come and have a validated marriage then so there is right. sort of hope for them, at least. It's like, there's obviously, degrees. There's, there's so, degrees. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's, yeah. But my brother, my brother, Greg, who's in the seminary, he's, he's going to be ordained a deacon in July. His priest told his spiritual director said, no, all three, point blank. Mm. And he spoke to another priest. No, all three. I asked several priests. That, that being said, they were all Novus Ordo priests. And all of them said, you go for the person, but you don't go to, to support it. For for mm. all of them, for all mm. of them. Oh, really? For all wow. of them. Okay. So that's why it's when it's like asking a priest, it's like, well, are you asking a traditional priest? Yeah. Asking, are you, you know? So that's, that's true. Not easy. Not easy. <laughs> and one one last question, because I got, I know I got, a, I had a whole bunch for you, and I and I actually have more here, but we'll wrap it up. How did you come? How did you get so knowledgeable so quickly? Because I, uh. I you know. All the all the books. I feel like when I see the you know you hold these books up, I'm like I feel Tim read all of these books. 
I did not read all the books. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I feel like I'm behind when I listen to no, you. <laughs> I didn't read all the books. I, I, I mean, my academic training is mainly in history and languages. So I did not study this stuff until a few years ago. A lot of this more theological stuff. In terms, right. I mean, I just became Catholic in 2013. So I've just been studying it since then, basically. So, um, I, I mean, I, the, the great thing about the faith that I discovered after le leaving Eastern Orthodoxy is that, the, I mean, these things are summarized by the church in a very, like, I mean, the great thing about Ott is, this is actually what I did in Ott. I went through and I read through every single bolded proposition and what degree it is. Yeah. So you can, you can just read through the entire thing by flipping through it in about 15 minutes and find out all these propositions and what degree they are. And then in a particular show that I'm going to talk about this particular thing, then I'll read the whole section and I'll just try to regurgitate everything. I mean, that's what I try to do at Meaning of Cat. I'm not an expert. I'm a layman. I'm just trying to do my best like everybody else is. So I'm just trying to regurgitate what is read in the authoritative sources and give that to the viewers. So... I, I mean, that may sound like I'm scholarly or whatever, but I'm literally just trying to repeat what I read from here to give it to people. And I really try to make a distinction between when, when I'm sharing my personal opinion, which means nothing, versus what Ott says. So uh, I think that these books, that's why I try to share it on, on the Meaning of Catholic website and the you resources. You do an excellent job of that. You do an excellent job of clarifying when it's your opinion versus when it's something that, and where you got it. I don't know how you remember all the different names of the encyclicals. I feel like I'm pretty good and you, and you know them straight through. Uh, that's no, and all the links that you have dynamite on your, on your YouTube page that it, it takes you right to everything that you said. It's great. Yeah. I, so, I mean, it's, it's really remarkable. If you just read like Ott, Denzinger, Primer. I mean, you've got 95% of what you need. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, that's only about 300 pages total with all the three books. So, I mean, you could just read 300 pages and you get 95% of what you need to that's wait. wait through. Well, no, I don't think it's, uh, is it Denzinger? 300 pages total? I don't know what it is. Denzinger? Oh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not doing my math properly here. Denzinger is 600 pages. I'm, I'm <laughs> wrong. Way wrong. Sorry, guys. It's, so it'd be six six hundred pages plus five hundred, plus Plumer is four hundred. Okay, okay, I'm way off. Sorry. So plus it's about sixteen. It's about sixteen hundred pages. But plus the, <laughs> plus the Bronzeland book, prob probably. Well, I, I wouldn't get into that. But no. well, the, the the good thing is that all they all of them have these index indices. All you do is look up the index. You're wondering about a question. Look up the index. Go in, go to the problem. Go to the situation. I mean, we've, we've got all these catechisms too. I mean, even the new catechism has a, a great deal of good stuff. Um, and even the older catechisms, there's just these question and answer, question and answer. I mean, it's just lazy, laying it out very clearly. So it's easy to get pretty knowledgeable about something because it's not a ton of books to deal with. You could just break it down into about five books. I mean, you, I mean, I would just add in the Roman catechism there. Yeah. I mean, you could get those three books plus, plus the Roman catechism or the Baltimore catechism. Pr Prumer, Trent. The Roman Catechism, the, the Denziger, Ott, and then what was the other one? I would I would just start with Baltimore three, Baltimore Catechism three. That's the easiest. Okay. Just read through that. That's easy, and that's you can get them. Ask you what, what if you were going to train someone? If someone was under your tutelage, how would you take? The, how would you walk them through to traditional Catholicism? But that's what you're basically saying here. Yeah, I was, and the the IPA app has a ton of that stuff uh, as audio. You can listen to the entire Baltimore three Catechism on audio. That's incredible. I mean, and it's free app. <laughs> I don't get money promoting it. It's just the best app ever. So it is. It is uh, awesome stuff, Tim. Like I said, th thanks a million. I really respect your opinion about about everything and your and your scholarship because, like you said, it's not just your opinion. You're we're passing on what we've received. That's our job as Catholics. So tell everyone where do we find more Tim Flanders? Not that oh, everyone yeah. doesn't know already. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if Catholic dot com. That's our apostolate. Um, that's basically I run. A uh, great deal of it. I have contributors with it too. My wife does all the graphic design and makes it look pretty. And uh, so, and we're always looking for contributors too. Uh, you've got an article on there yourself, Gene. If anybody wants to contribute to Meaning of Catholic, our mission is to unite Catholics against the enemies of Holy Church and pass on the faith to our children. So that's what we're all about, meaningofcatholic.com. That's it. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Tim. I really appreciate it. God bless you. God bless your family. Thanks, brother. You too.
All right. Take care.